watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. Yay! It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood, wonderful day in the neighborhood, wonderful day in the neighborhood, and nobody can deny. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. How you all doing today? Good. It is so good to see you all. Can I tell you all a little bit about myself and Mr. Pop from Neighborhood? Yes. yes. Do you know at, eight, at age eight years old, I was rebellious, didn't want to listen to my parents, didn't want to listen to my school teachers. I was kicked out of three elementary schools because of my bad behavior. I was placed into a juvenile facility called Long Lane Children's Village. Somebody say DCYS. DCYS. That stands for Department of Children and Youth Services. I was removed from my mommy's house and put into a juvenile facilities. Say Long Lane. Long Lane. Now it's called Connecticut Juvenile Training School. Somebody say State Receiving House. State Receiving House. Say Warehouse Point. Warehouse Point. Now it's called Connecticut Children Place. Now it's called Connecticut Children's Place. I'm showing you all a pattern. I want you all to understand something. What you do now in your life determine where you'll be and what you'll be later on in life. I started out not listening to my parents, but in Mr. Pop's neighborhood, we listen to our parents, right? Yes. We accept authority, right? Yes. No bullying, right? Yes. No drug use, right? Yes. No gang violence, right? Yes. No peer pressure, right? Yes. We accept authority from adults and our parents, right? Yes. We do the same, we go to school, correct? Yes. Now, I want you all to know, you all have a right to ask me any questions you want to ask me and don't feel ashamed or don't feel like you're going to hurt my feelings. If you want to ask me about the scars on my head, you're welcome to do that. If you want to ask about the holes in my neck, you're welcome to do that because I'm going to explain to you why, what the purpose of these holes in my neck and these scars in my head, okay? Yes. But number one, I want you all to know something. Take life serious, okay? Take your education serious. I want you all to realize you're going to show your teachers respect. Okay? Yes. Listen to this. At eight years old, I was cursing teachers. I was teasing other kids. Say ranking. Ranking. Ranking is not nice because people can't help the way they look. People can't help the way they dress. You all know, know that? So it's not right to tease people. Say bullying. Bullying. That's a form of bullying. That's called verbal assault. Can you say verbal assault? Verbal assault. And we don't want to assault nobody verbally, right? No. Doesn't people have feelings? Yes. We don't want to hurt people's feelings, right? No. We want to help people's feelings, correct? Yes. So wasn't I wrong? Yes. No. Yes, I was wrong. Anytime you hurt people's feelings, that's wrong. I didn't have no right to tease other kids. Because what that does is that engage other kids. Say engage. Engage. That makes other kids participate and get involved. Now all the classroom is against one kid. Is that fair? No. That makes a kid feel like an outcast, right? Yes. yes. That makes that kid go home upset. It distracts the kid from doing their work, right? Yes. yes. Let me show you all something about bullying. Always remember this. Say uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Say intimidation. Anytime a person is uncomfortable in your presence, that's bullying. Anytime you intimidate anybody, that's bullying. Can I give you all an example? Yes. If two ladies, young girls, stand at their locker and another young lady walk by and she sucks her teeth and rolls her eyes at her, do you know that's bullying? Yes. Do you know why it's bullying? 
because the person feels uncomfortable. If I'm sitting at the front of the class and you all sitting at your desk and the pencil sharpener is in the back, when I get up from my desk in the front to walk towards the back and I kick your chair, how would that make you feel? Uncomfortable. How would it make you feel? Uncomfortable. What do we call uncomfortable? Bullying. What do we call bullying? Grief. Intimid Intimidation. Intimidation. Is that right to do? If I kick your chair, walking up to the pencil sharpener, and as I come back, what do you all expect me to do? Do it again, do it again right? Yeah. Well, doesn't that distract you from studying? Doesn't that distract you from doing your work? Yes. Anytime you have somebody in your classroom that makes you feel uncomfortable, you don't take matters in your own hand. You're supposed to notify the teacher and let the teacher know there's somebody in the classroom that's making the whole class uncomfortable. That's the right thing to do. There's no such thing as snitching. You know why it's not? Would you want one of your classmates to get hurt? No. So you want to make the teacher aware of it before somebody get hurt, right? Yes. yes. Do any of y'all have any questions? How long have you been living this lifestyle? Which lifestyle? The bad lifestyle. All my life, from eight years old, I showed you all a pattern from eight years old and it followed me to my adult age. You remember early when I say what you are today determines what you'll be and where you'll be later on in life? Mm -hmm. I started at eight years old to show you all a pattern. But understand something. It's okay to make a mistake. But whenever you repeat that mistake, it's no longer a mistake. It's a decision. And then it becomes a pattern. When you were in jail, did you ever feel like you wanted to change your lifestyle while you were there? In the beginning, I had on what you call my Superman suit. I was putting up a Superman image, like nothing can happen to me or nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to be all right, and I'm going to get back out and do the same thing I was doing but do it better. That's the attitude that I have. How long have you been blind? 13 years. You remember early when I was told you at eight years old I started my rebellious state? Yes. You remember early on when I say what you are today determines where you'll be and what you'll be later on in life? Yes. I was determined at eight years old not to listen to my parents or to listen to adults. I became a teenager in and out of juvenile. I became an adult. Started selling weed, got promoted from selling that, started selling cocaine, heroin. Say destroy. Destroy. I was destroying my community. You know how we talk about Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein? Yes. We have terrorists walking around in the community right now. I was a terrorist. Anytime a person destroy their community, they are a terrorist. Anytime I destroy a parent, I destroy the child. Anytime I destroy the child, I destroy the community. Anytime I destroy the community, I destroy society. When a parent has to come to me to purchase drugs, don't you know that deprives the kid from having the necessary things they need, like clothing, food, a place to stay? And now that shows that a kid have to have, a kid wound up having rebellious behavior because if the parent don't buy the kids, or supply the kids with clothes. When that kid come to school, other kids say, you had on the same thing for two or three days. Doesn't that kid feel bad about that? Yes. But I'm responsible for that. Because if the parent didn't have to come to me to purchase drugs, they'll be able to take care of that child like they should, right? Yes. Now you see how the terrorists destroying people? Yes. But I don't want you all to live that life. I want you all to listen to your parents, listen to your school teachers, listen to anybody that's in authority because it's going to help you later on in life. Don't you know kindergarten set you up for the first grade? Yeah. First grade prepare you for the second grade? Yeah. So on and so forth. Yeah. So if you miss out in kindergarten, you won't be prepared for the first grade. Y'all understand that? Yes. Any more questions? Any other questions? When did you stop living the life that you used to live? That's a great question. Give her a hand.
I was selling heroin and cocaine, and these group of guys staged a robbery. They pretended as though they buying drugs from me, but they had a group of their friends come up while they were purchasing drugs from me and stick me up and stick them up. But in essence, they were all a group, they were all a crew, and they was trying to rob me. They shot me in the head with a 9mm gun. See the hole in my side of my head? Yes. See the scar on my head? Yes. Say fragments. Fragments. Any time you get shot with a bullet, small pieces of fragments put holes in your skull. The doctors had to lay me on a table and turn my body in an arch. They laid a small television upon the wall. They took a needle this long with bright colored dye in it. They stuck it up under my spine. They took a handsaw and they sawed my scalp from temple to temple. They pilt my scalp back because I had fluid leaking from my nose and my mouth. So in order for them to find out where the fragments was at, they put the dye in so they could look up on the TV monitor and see the dye come out the holes. That's when they peeled my scalp back, stitched up the hole, sealed up the holes, stitched me back. I had two trachs in my throat, a large and a medium, so I can breathe. I was in a coma and I was hooked up to a machine. But say, I brought this on myself. I don't have anyone to blame. I can't blame the people who shot me. I put myself in that position for this to happen. I don't have nobody to blame but myself. Say cop out and scapegoat. Mm. Cop out and scapegoat. You know, people use cop outs and scapegoats. They try to find excuses why things happen to them. There's no excuse. If I'd have been listening to my parents, this wouldn't have happened to me. How long were you in the coma for? Six months. When did you find Jesus in your life? Good question. Give her a hand. <laughs> After I got out of my coma, my mommy came down to Atlanta, Georgia, to be by my bedside and had prayer. And God heard her prayer. I came back to Hartford, Connecticut, and I couldn't wallow in pity. I started going to church, Sunday school. I couldn't read a Bible because I was blind. But the first lady of my church, which was my Sunday school teacher, provided me with audio tape, which the Bible is on audio tape. And I was able to study the Bible. And I accepted Christ in my life. And I say, I'm going to start talking to people across the United States and letting them know that living that lifestyle, consequences will happen. You make choices, consequences follow. This is the choice I made. This is the consequence I have to deal with for the rest of my life. How did you get the holes in your neck? How did I get the holes in my neck? Give them a hand, y'all. In order for them to hook me up to tubes and machines and my lungs, the doctors had to place a large trach and a medium trach in my throat so they could monitor me through the machines and so I can breathe. I was able to breathe on my own. Did it hurt when they were sewing back your head? They had me under anesthesia. I was put to sleep, and I was numb. I couldn't feel anything. Seeing as though you're doing all of this big stuff in your life, has being blind affected you in any way? No. When did your mom, like, accept you when you were being rude to her and disobey her at the age of eight? You know, good question. You know, when parents try to talk to their child, they never want to give up on their child. But somewhere along the line, somewhere in life, a parent has to say, well, that child is making decisions on their own, and they got to deal with the consequences. But my mommy kept on all through life, even through my adult age, kept trying to talk to me about living that lifestyle. And I was hard-headed and wouldn't listen. When you were selling drugs and being bad in school and getting kicked out, did you, anything, did you think that anything bad would happen to you? No. You remember earlier when I said I had my Superman suit? Yeah. A lot of times we think that nothing can happen, nothing will happen, 
that we're so tough and we're so smart and we're so big, we're so bad, but something will happen. Not might happen, something will always happen. Do you think if you didn't have the shield up, the Superman shield up, a lot of this would have pre been prevented? That's a good question. Give her a hand. <laughs> That's what you call a negative attitude. I had a negative attitude in life and about life. But guess what? In Mr. Pop's neighborhood, we don't believe in engaging or indulging in that lifestyle. We're here to help one another. When one person hurt, we'd be concerned about that person, right? Yes. If we have something to share with that person, we share with that person, right? Yes. That's called positive. Say positive. Positive. Attitude. Attitude. That's what we're about in Mr. Pop's neighborhood. And guess what? We have to set an example for other neighborhoods. So people want to be a part of Mr. Pop's neighborhood. And then people want to be a part of what's good. Am I correct? Yes. So we have to demonstrate that by what? Say setting example. Setting example. Now guess what? When do you all get your progress report from school? School just started? You get it when? Probably in a month or so. Probably Friday. So I want everybody to bring in their progress report. And we're not going to criticize, but we're going to look at everybody's progress report one at a time. And we're going to look and see how we can strengthen it if it's weak. We're going to see how we can make progress. Y'all understand that? Yes. If y'all lacking in a certain area, we're going to try to find help for you. And I don't want you all to be ashamed. Y'all understand that? Yes. I don't want you all to feel like you can't talk about your behavior, you can't talk about your schoolwork, because we're about helping one another. If you need a tutor, we'll find you a tutor. If you fail in English, we're going to work on your English. But I don't want any of you all to be ashamed. And any time one of you all is lacking in a certain area, it's up to us to encourage one another, not laugh at one another. Y'all understand that? Yes. And I want you all to stay in contact with one another, see how each other's doing. And if you have a problem, we're going to talk about it. And we're going to do what you call problem solving. Say problem solving. Problem solving. Say we're about solutions. We're about solutions. To the problem. To the problem. And we're going to help one another out. And we're going to help one another out. From this day forth. From this day forward. That's a good understanding? Yes. Um, when you got out of jail, how did you feel? Give me a hand. You remember earlier I told you I still had that negative attitude that I was going to get out and be a better criminal. It took this triumph. Most people call it a tragedy, but I don't call it a tragedy. I call it a triumph. Because if this wouldn't have never happened to me, I wouldn't be before y'all right now. Do y'all know I was content with the way I was living? And I want y'all to understand something. I'm not trying to kill your dream. I'm not telling you all you can't grow up and own a nice car. You can't grow up and own a nice home, have a nice family. But what I'm trying to demonstrate to y'all is how you obtain it. Y'all understand that? Yes. And right now in your life, at the age you are right now, don't focus on materialistic things. Don't focus on a nice car, a nice home. You're entitled to it. You'll get it later on in life. But if you focus on it now, it will hinder you from your studying. It will hinder you from what you're trying to learn in school. Your primary focus should be getting a better education. Pops, I have a question. Did you lose a lot of friends through this lifestyle living? The bad lifestyle? What are we doing? Somebody have a good question. <laughs> Can I share something with you? Sure. Yes. And I want y'all to understand this. Guess who was my real friend? Your mom, Your mom and God. And guess what? The same peers who I was talking about, calling them square, calling them herbs, calling them lame, calling them green, the same kids who I was talking about 
wound up being successful in life because they was not engaging in what I was doing. Those were my real friends telling me, Pop, change your life. Don't associate with that crew. Don't, don't do what you see those other guys do. I turn around and say, y'all mind your business. This is my life. But all those kids who I was talking like that to, they got successful careers now. They have beautiful families. They live in a life. And that's what I want you all to understand. It wasn't the ones who was engaging and crying with me was my friend. Those wasn't my real friends. I want you all to know something too. Your real friend is the ones who's concerned about you and try to encourage you to do right. If you would never got shot, would you still probably would have been a drug dealer? Yes. You remember, you remember early on when I said I was content with the way I was living? This had to happen for me to change my life. But what I want to do is to make you all aware of, don't let something like this happen to your life to make you want to change your life. You're in a position to change your life now because you see the consequences that I'm going through. I work in a school system with kids now, and you know what I urge teachers to do? Is to give a child work that's challenging because the work I was given wasn't challenging, so I figured I'll get the work done. Now it's time for me to play around and have fun. That was wrong because I was inconsiderate. I should have came to the understanding that even though I was finished with my work, there's other students trying to get their work done. So I was very inconsiderate. Was your mother, like, did she accept you all your life? Like, was she always still around and talk to you even though she was starting to give up? Well, remember early on when I said a parent is going to always be a parent? A parent may not like the way their child is living, but a parent is determined to try to help that child to do right, so they're going to constantly try to encourage that child and to discipline that child. But by me being hard-headed and didn't want to listen to it. Did you ever think you'll make it this far? No, I was, I was told by adults at eight years old that I wouldn't make it to see nine years old. When I became nine, I was told I'm not going to make it to be ten. They were really trying to encourage me to turn my life around. They wasn't trying to speak negative in my life. What they were trying to do was frighten me and let me know that if I keep living that lifestyle, I won't make it become a teenager. So that's the time when you was thinking about it, when they was telling you the adults? Yes, I was thinking about it, but I was still being hard-headed. What I would do is act good in front of the adults. As uh, soon they turned their back or soon I wasn't around them, i start back with my lifestyle. But guess what? I was only hurting myself. Is there any other reason besides you thought it was cool, like that you lived this whole lifestyle? Everything I did in life was a decision I made. I'm not here to try to give y'all excuses. I wouldn't dare give y'all excuses. Everything that happened to him in my life, I'm the reason, I'm the cause for it, because of the decisions I made in life. I have no one to blame. Why did you really make those decisions? Say rebellious. Rebellious. Wanting to do bad. Wanting the kids to look up to me. Say peer pressure. Peer pressure. That's what I want to talk to you all about when I spoke to you earlier about peer pressure. A peer pressure is making somebody do something they want to not want to do just to feel accepted. But you all don't have to be accepted by your other peers in order for you to do wrong. When you were younger, did you believe in a Jesus or a God, or you just had other things in your mind? No, I didn't. I was what you call a church goer. I was going to church. My mom was bringing me to church, but I wasn't interested in church. Again, that's back to my rebellious behavior. My life would just consist of doing wrong. I don't want this to happen to you all for you all to learn your lesson. I want you all to look at my situation and to say, I don't want that to happen to me, nor any friends of mine. I want you all to make a decision today that you are going to work on your behavior. You're going to listen to your parents. Even though your parents tell you stuff you don't want to hear right now, it pays off later. And most of all, I want you all to encourage each other. Your other younger brothers and sisters, encourage them as well. When you see them disrespectful to your mom and your daddy, you pull them aside and say, that's wrong. 
when you was um, shot in the head and you got the operation and the fragments and stuff, when you woke up, did you feel that pain? They had me on all kinds of pain medication, but do you know when I woke up, I was in denial? Say denial. Denial. I didn't want to accept that I was blind. When did it finally hit you? Like, like when did it finally hit you that you could not see any longer? I had to accept it. And, 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 and I want you all to know something. That's the only time you'll be able to move forth is you got to accept your situation, accept the condition you're in, and try to make it better. As long as you're in denial, you'll never make any progress. Do y'all understand that? Yes. The start of recovery is to accept the fact that you have a problem, you're being rebellious, you don't want to listen to your parents, you don't listen to your guidance counselor, you don't listen to your teacher or your principal, once you all come to that understanding that you must listen to adults, that's when you're going to start progressing. Do y'all understand that? Yes. How long has it been since you started working with kids? Since 1999. 97, I came out of my coma, came back to Hartford. 97, 98, I started recuperating. My parents and stuff, my brother, my mommy helped me regain my strength back to get my weight back. Start recovery mentally, starting to accept the fact that the situation I'm in. And that's when I started determined, that's when I was determined to help out young people. Did you feel like you should have blamed it on the person who shot you at the time, where your mindset was? Yeah, you, you remember earlier when I said I was in denial? and I didn't want to accept the fact that I was blind. Yeah. I was trying to find every excuse, the reason for me being in that bed. But I never focused on I was the reason. When you were selling drugs and doing all this bad stuff, who did you want to be like? Because it seemed like no one in your family was like that. I was influenced by the neighborhood, I was influenced by other people. I was influenced to the fact that I don't want to work an honest job. I was looking at fast money, thinking it was easy money. But at the same time, I was destroying people's lives. After you found out you was blind, did you thank God that at least nothing worse had happened? Like you could have died anything? You know, God gave me another chance so I could show young people about choices and consequences. I want to thank each and every one of you all for taking time out after school to come being a part of Mr. Pop's neighborhood. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. Wonderful day in the neighborhood. Wonderful day in the neighborhood. And nobody can deny. Thank you all for coming to Mr. Pop's neighborhood.